I see we're streaming already, but not ready to start yet. So don't do anything embarrassing, Chris. <laughs> All right, I see it's 1030. I don't know if anyone in the CTN crew wants to say anything first or if Chris and I should just go for it. Oh my goodness, we have people from all over the world. This is exciting. All right, well, I, I yeah, look at, we're seeing in the chat. You guys pop in uh, where you're from in the chat just so we have some idea of how worldwide we are, because this is awesome. So cool. All right, I'm gonna get going here because Chris has amazing things to show and the more we can show them, the better. So um, I will start off by just saying good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Tracy Miller Zarnicki and I've been part of the animation industry for uh, 23 years or so now. I started back in publicity and production management at Walt Disney Feature Animation, worked on The Emperor's New Groove and Chicken Little, and that time in Disney is where I met the amazing Tina Price, who, again, I have to commend on, first of all, her creating CTN out of thin air in the first place, but also in pivoting to make it work this year. And it really is awesome that, like, we can all be connected from anywhere in the world. So, wow, I'm, I'm super excited to be part of this. So um, in, in my last 15 years, I've, I've written a lot of uh, books about the art and the history and the production of animation. So if you recognize my weird name, that may be where you know me from. But um, today we are here to talk about Chris Sickles. So let me let him introduce himself so that we can get into some of his truly astounding work. So Chris, your turn. Thanks, Tracy. I'm going to see if I can, I'll share this screen here. So I just want to say hello. Thanks for having me. Um, I got to present at CTN a few years back, and it was probably one of the most open events that I had been to as far as everybody being accessible and excited, um, sketch sessions. I mean, everything, it was a, a whole different feel for me. So I'm just tickled to be part of this one um, and hopefully can impart a little bit of advice that either can steer you in a, a different direction or encourage you to trust your gut, I suppose. So um, I'll start. I'm uh, an illustrator by, by trade. So I'm a visual problem solver, whether it be for books or magazines. Um, I do some stop motion, but it's mostly for, um, uh, mostly um, as an enthusiast. Um, so for a typical book cover project, you'll have a handful of sketches that I'll submit. This one in particular was a story about a, a girl who had a discovered she had a, a strong connection to bears. So we'll, we'll work with the art director and editor and we'll try to find a way to either take an existing sketch and, and run with it, or sometimes you have to modify a sketch to kind of to uh, work with the layout a little bit better. And once the sketch is approved, we'll move right to uh, looking for colors and textures and references. Um, there's a 
a skirt in this particular story that's um, embroidered with a three-headed dragon and a, a mountain. And I had to kind of figure out a way to create that prop. And then this is the final image. Um, and then in cover, so you'll see how the cover text sort of works with that. And then this is just a simple, what I call a fly through. So this kind of lets you see the set as it stands when it's shot. Um, most everything is done in camera um, with, in this, in this case, the trees were made out of twigs that I painted to kind of fit that world. Um, you'll see that the bird was actually on a little wire. So some, some animals are put in the background a bit. So this just kind of zooms you through um, and it lets you see how everything's kind of made by hand to kind of fit into that, in, into that world. And then as you pull back, you'll see that really all that's constructed is just what's inside the camera view. Everything else sort of just falls off the edges. And even the mound of snow is just made just enough a mound to work, but you'll see everything's really pretty two dimensional there. So that gives you a little peek into that process. Um, and then we can start on, we can go on back to uh, the Q&A with Tracy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Feels like going into a, a, a magical toy store or something. I don't know. <laughs> with everything, you know, especially I'm sitting here looking at your studio behind you and I just, I really want to get in there, but also I want to know how often you dust it. <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a nightmare in that regard, yes. <laughs> I can imagine so, but still an awesome nightmare to have. So, all right, so yeah, let's get talking more so that uh, our audience gets to know you a little bit and, and your background. So let's start with uh, the early days. Let's go all the way back to, what is your first recollection of being interested in art? Um, I think some of my earliest memories are, are you know, working with coloring books and comics and trying to figure out how, it, it was weird, how, how they made Superman's blue hair work. How, why did that even work and how did that work? Um, I just remembered sort of pondering on that as a kid. Um, but I, I didn't grow up in an artist family. Uh, my mom would take me to um, the local university to see the art museum there. Um, and she was just in, encouraging with that. So I guess I was fortunate enough to have the interest to draw and then have the, the folks kind of um, um, encourage it as well, which, which I thought was, I don't know, good. Because where, where, I, where I grew up, you, you didn't just go off and become an artist. It was something you did on, on the weekends. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a more rural kind of growing up instead of a more like, let's pop into the museum today sure. for more inspiration. Um, so, so it sounds like your family was supportive, even if you were out in the, I don't want to call it the sticks, but you know, more Pretty rural. Much. <laughs> Pretty much. Indiana is about as, as, as middle of, as middle as you can be. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well then, so, so were you able to take some schooling or education path that helped you launch to where you are? Oh, most definitely. I think I, I owe so much of what I do and how I've gotten to where I'm at from my teachers, especially, um, I mean, I had the same art teacher in junior high and high school and she was really the first person that told me art could be a career option. She would drive me to portfolio reviews in the, at, the local, at colleges in the region um, and just really show me that even with my background and, and what I felt were my inadequacies that there, there was a whole world out there of art. It didn't, you didn't just have to um, do paintings for people's sofas or design shampoo bottles. You could, there's a whole world between that between that um, spectrum. So I think her giving that, me that encouragement and then that led to um, you know, college. So I got to go to the Art Academy in Cincinnati and I met instructors there that introduced me to, um, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Awesome. And I wanna talk about like, uh, so when I went to Art Academy, this is what I introduced the illustration like this sort of realistic, um, liter liter uh, literal narrative, I guess you would call it, which is stuff that I love, but I thought that, that was, that's what illustration was supposed to be. So it wasn't until I met an instructor, her name was Susan Curtis, and she introduced me to the Quay Brothers. And I have no idea why she sort of put me on this whole different course. She basically locked me in a room with a hot kettle of tea and told me that I needed to watch these VHS tapes of, these, of this animation to, um, and not come out until it was finished. So I had never seen anything like this before. 
Um, and it wasn't until several years later when that work sort of to, started to surface in my work again, but she really tried to connect, make the connection for me that illustration could be more about an emotional problem solving or an emotional connection with a viewer as opposed to just a, a, a photorealistic connection. I had another professor that introduced me to Alexander Calder and his circus. I mean, I knew of his mobiles and that type of work, but when I got to see the documentary of him performing this, um, show where he's basically crawling around on the floor making these little wire figures dance and move and do tricks. Um, it showed me that art could also be playful, that it, it, you could be, uh, uh, it could be fun. Because in college, a lot of times you, you take things too seriously. You, you try to come up with things that are maybe um, real heavy or dark, especially in the 90s. <laughs> so uh, this kind of opened the door that it, that it could definitely be playful. So we can go back to, uh, I guess we go to the next question if I'm not rambling too much. No, you are not rambling too much. Um, that's, that's awesome. So talk through the school, the school days. So then once, once you finished schooling, how did you approach finding work that entailed art? And, and obviously not designing shampoo bottles, although I think you could do an awesome shampoo bottle. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, but, but, Let's, let's talk about finding work and, and, and what that was like for you back then and even as you progress. But, but you know, also maybe, I don't know if you can ex relate to today's world a bit, you know, since a lot of our audience today is probably just trying to come into the industry in today's world. So, yeah, let's talk about work. Right. Well, so when I first started, you know, there wasn't there wasn't the Internet. And you went so you went to the local bookstores and you found um you would just go through, I would literally go through all the magazines and try to find magazines that I felt hired work that were, that was in the same sort of attitude of my work. Not necessarily what my work looked like, but what I thought, maybe if there was an art director or uh, art department that I felt sort of resonated with the work that I was doing. And I'd come away with maybe 10 names after two days of research. And it, so it wasn't, it wasn't uh, um sort of the shotgun effect it was a very targeted sort of effect and you really had to I knew that with my with my work it was going to be very limited in in the audience and I needed to find the right people to get it in front of so I think that the technique is different today with social media and everything um I think in some regards people are more accessible but um I think it still comes down to finding the right people to get your work in front of instead of trying to think that your work needs to be in front of uh, 10,000 or 30,000 people, really, you just got to have a few that really it resonates with. So it's, it's a matter of putting that work out there and, and getting it to connect with the right people. And there's not, there's no real formula to it, um, other than trying to put out what, what you are most excited about. Because I think that if that excitement comes through in your work, then people will, will relate to that more than just a pretty picture. Yeah, absolutely. Finding that connection is is key, I think. And and yeah, I, I think back to finding a job in the old pre-internet days and it, it's that was daunting. But I think sometimes in today's world, people might get a little overwhelmed with all the options that are presented to you. But all in all, I feel like having things like, you know, LinkedIn and, you know, communities that come together like CTN has, like it's it's really a precious resource to have all that opportunity to connect in today's it, it, world. Most, in de most definitely, I think it, it can be, at the same time, it can be inspiring and it can also be daunting or, um, cause you see so much good stuff, you're like, oh my God, I can't even, I can't even compete, you know? And um, when I remember being being young enough to know that nobody knew who I was and I knew that there was stuff out there, but if I'd have known how much was out there, it probably would have been really daunting. And I think that that, that can be a real, a real challenge today. Um, I even find it now in my, in later in my career that sometimes you just have to shut off because there's so much good stuff out there. You're, it, it can be uh, over, overwhelming. Yeah, I, I could see how that could be an obstacle or a, a moment that makes you question yourself. But at the same time, I'm hoping people look at it like, I'm a member of an amazing community. I'm putting forth positive, exciting work as well and, and part of this energy. So I hope our, that's a way people can look at it now. So let's, let's, let's think back to your, the first job you landed. What, what, do you remember what that was and how you felt in getting that job? Like, what was that like for you? 
Oh my gosh. My first, my first job. Um, yeah, it was just for a small little magazine in Cincinnati. I mean, it, it was a regional magazine. It wasn't anything big, but it, it, what it did was that it just took that one art director to take a chance on, you know, I was still in college. So to basically to take a chance on a student to meet a deadline, to solve the problem and produce something that, that made her magazine better, you know, in, in all regards and made her job easy. Um, and so for me, that, that was um, a huge confidence booster. I mean, the piece wasn't very good, and, you know, looking back, but it was a start, you know, and I think that that's, that's how you have to look at, especially when you're beginning, it's all a start. It's not the, and it, it was paintings back then, and now I'm doing three-dimensional work. So that sort of, a, you got to let your career sort of evolve and grow. Um, and I think that, that was, but it was definitely a, a boost because you got, you got paid to do what you loved, you know, in, in, in some regards. So that was sort of the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about the career path because I think what I find is sometimes people set this unrealistic expectation of I'm going to finish my school and I'm going to be a director. Boom. I'm going okay. right there. I'm right. right. And that's truly not um, a, a normal path. I mean, I'm sure it could happen. But, but let's talk about like careers, you know, like, like, would you say yours is like a, a winding road of discovery or you had these goals you were going to hit, like talk us through some of your milestones and, and successes and failures, anything you can do, just sort of let us follow your path a bit and hear how that came to be. Yeah. So I, my, I, I guess for me, I would call it a wobbly trajectory. Um, it was, a uh, looking back, it, it, it seemed very, um, unplanned and unpredictable but you you tried to plan it as best you could you know so I, I started out as a painter doing this this type of work um, and I felt I felt like it was uh, it was good and it was paying work but I didn't know that it was necessarily completely me you know trying to figure out the best way to be a, a visual problem solver and create work that's relevant um, and then there's there was this one day, this was a couple of years out of school, I created this little sculpture based purely on just a sketch out of the sketchbook. And I had no, this was another one of those examples of where things just kind of come out of nowhere. But this was when the Quay brothers started to surface into work a little bit. Um, but I didn't know how to apply this type of stuff to what I was doing as an illustrator. So I, I felt really directionless, even though um, I was getting work and, 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 you know, not necessarily being successful, but at least being, um, but at least working. Um, so then I got an opportunity to apply some of the three-dimensional work to published work, and it started to really click. It felt like it was more, um, more about what I loved about puppets and animation and fabrication also folded in with what I loved about illustration. Um, so I feel like that, that sort of stuff helped me sort of grow beyond even what I learned in college. And I think that was important that I was starting to do stuff that was beyond what I was, what I graduated doing. I mean, it, it's that sort of mentality of letting your um, portfolio continue to grow and, and not become just sort of stagnant. Um, I had the opportunity to work on some pitches for animation, you know, and it's um, work that I wasn't trained to do, but I really loved doing. I really had this um, excitement. And I think that was the biggest thing that was that you couldn't not do it. The, the, the excitement was so, so uh, visceral. So we, we sold the house in Ohio and we moved out West and we pitched this show to different studios and had some initial interest, but it didn't, it didn't pan out. And that was sort of um, one of those things was like, Oh my God, I couldn't have failed worse. You know, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been even any more uh, disastrous. And now in, Burbank trying to be an animator when I was trained to be an illustrator and I just felt like I was in this weird sort of spot of um, enthusiasm but that was sort of an unrealistic enthusiasm but I didn't know anything else but to keep trying so we worked on some other shows and they didn't pan out really in the end but for me the biggest thing was that um, the people that you work with on those projects um, the relationships that you built were almost more important than the product that you were building in a way. So there are people that I met, you know, 20, 20 odd years ago that I'm still working with today on other projects and the relationships have only just grown from that. So even though you can, you can feel like there's that struggle or this sort of endless cycle of failures, um, 
if you step back and look at it, all those are sort of necessary stepping stones as, as far as going, going forward. Um, so I had, the, I had the opportunity to do some character design tests for Nickelodeon back then. And I actually got a job offer and I had no idea that it would even work. Um, but when that offer came through, it really made me think about what I was doing as an illustrator with, with Red Nose Studio and what I would be doing as a, as a character designer at Nickelodeon. I didn't know that I could do both. And I felt like if I, if I did the one, I'd have better pay and more security and probably better skills but if I, if I left Red Nose behind and, and put that on the back burner, I, I didn't know that I could really uh, let that go. So I, I think I'd, 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 I had spent these few years chasing this sort of animation dream but, and chasing this whatever it was. But when it came down to it, I realized that what I had the whole, the whole time was, was what I was really passionate about. And I think that was sort of the, that was the difficult thing for me. Um, but once we decided we weren't going to be chasing animation anymore that we could move back to Indiana. And I, we found a little studio and um, decided to try to put the, put everything into the 3d work and, and see if, if I could make that fly, you know? Um, so it's very wobbly for sure. And <laughs> sometimes, sometimes discouraging, but it's sort of a necessary sort of sequence of failures, I think. Yeah, I think, uh, you never know where the path is going to take you. But I think part of being open to the path is, is half the battle, right? I mean, you know, Oh yeah, definitely. You can't, you can't, you sort of, if, if, if something comes at you or an opportunity comes at you, you can't just, um, uh, not take it or take it based on, um, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, like realistic expectations or not, but you just have to, you just have to keep, keep trying because otherwise you, you, I don't know, if you don't take that risk, then you can't, you can't um, get to that next level, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. It's strange because you, it. still, you still deal with that. Even me at my age, I still deal with that sort of that struggle of, of what's going to help you grow the best, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's a, something a lot of people struggle with in every walk of life is like every step is a choice, right? So if you just trust yourself to make a choice and then move forward in that path, <laughs> you, you take that energy with you and go, right? Yeah, I, go. I think you're, you're right. That's, that's a perfect way of putting it, taking, taking that energy with you. You have to keep that momentum going, whether it's a, you know, and you don't really know if it's going to be a, a, a wrong turn or not until you get through it. But that wrong turn might lead you to something that you wouldn't have necessarily come across, which is, which is hard, you know, cause you, you, it's, it's hard to trust that. Yeah. But, but good things can happen. So sure. Yeah, let's, let's, let's explore more. So, so you've, you've chosen to be an independent artist, right? You've, you've said, no, thank, thank you, but no, thank you to the Nickelodeon and, and other animation world. Um, so let's talk through, some of the challenges of the reality of being an independent artist, that some of the difficult moments, how you navigate them. Talk us through some of that. Yeah. Um, I think some of the most difficult things are the, it's the uncertainty, you know, not knowing exactly um, whether it's when the next job's going to come through, you know, as, as a freelance artist, nothing is um, sort of set and scheduled. It's all job by job. So a lot of times that's sort of a, a big weight looming over your head, you know, um, Sometimes it feels like if I uh, continue to feed and and explore and build that visual vocabulary, what's looming overhead, I can kind of um, keep that positive attitude and not not get too overwhelmed by what you would consider a fear. Um, and then just keeping your eyes on the horizon, you know, trying to always look forward and and look past the the immediates and um, kind of keep it positive with a for the long haul, I think is the, is the biggest, the biggest thing for me and keeping that frame of mind sort of, uh, um, I don't know, um, calm because especially with, uh, everything that's been going on, especially in the last nine months, it's, it's hard to sort of stay positive in, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Sometimes you just got to keep going forward, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> I didn't have as cool of a car as that was to go forward in, but you know, um, so, so great. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so yeah, I'd say in, in today's world is definitely a time of unknown, but, but I will say that people who are artists and, and, you know, independent might have a leg up on others because they've been doing it this way for a while. You at home and your silo, you know, like, here's what I do. Um, so that in itself is, is a plus and a minus, right? Like if you feel like, you, okay, I could be isolated all this time, but, but you're not like, you're still connected. That's the thing that I think this pandemic has kind of shown a lot of people is it kind of cuts out some of the unnecessary or less necessary stuff in life. If you have to be stuck at home or safer at home, I think is the better way to look at it. So, right. so right. I feel like, you know, you've been in that mode for a while, you know, of being working from home. So let's, let's talk about what happens when you're working from home, because, you know, I, I find this as a, as a balance point as well. Like how do you divide your time between paid work and just personal fun work that you want to do. Cause I feel like I've been working from home for 15 years and I feel like there's always something I should be sitting at my computer doing when like, you know, I also want to go take a walk or I also, right. you know, like, how do you, how do you divide your time? Well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, malleable every day, but, but the biggest thing for me is, so we have, we have a young family, so we'll, um, the kids go to school or are in school um, for a set amount of time. And that's really my, that's my work day. And then after that amount of time, it's sort of, you got to balance it with family and, uh, you know, your adult duties. And, and uh, um, so there's that sort of work life balance. And then there's also work as far as, um, you know, it's not when I, when I do personal work, it's not necessarily, I turn down commercial work to do it, but there's not always commercial work on the table. So for me, if, if there's not a job on the table and if I'm not, not working on something else, I'll go, I get kind of, that's when all the fears creep in, you know, all the sort of the, like the self, the self doubt. So I'll, I'll take a, a storyline and try to explore it. And in this case, it was a, a, um, a little animation that um, I, knew I wanted to try and I had about three months of really downtime so I could really explore it and spend some time into it. Um, and it, and I didn't know exactly where it would go or what it would lead to, but it allowed me to explore, um, experimenting with, uh, line work and stop motion and see if maybe there's a way to kind of create a visual dialogue that, um, uh, my work could live in because I'm not a, I'm not a, a Leica studio. Um, and so the type of animation that I do is sort of wonky and off, off kilter a little bit. And I thought if I start to produce that type of work, that's what people will see, you know, they won't try to try to shoehorn it into a type of animation that I'm, that is beyond my skill set, essentially. So trying to find out ways to, um, create work that takes your weaknesses and makes them strengths. So there was a project that came across about a, a PSA for, um, sort of like the little guy fighting the big carbon monster as far as carbon regulations. And I think if I hadn't have done what I did with creosote and sort of that washy line work, it, I wouldn't have been able to create a solution that would work for that animation, you know? Um, so sometimes that the personal work that you do, you may feel like you're just doing it to, to keep yourself busy, but you're also doing it to sharpen those skills and, and push your work sort of, um, forward and hopefully set you up for a better scenario for projects down the road. And I think that's the, that's sort of the leap of confidence that you have to take or um, maybe not leap of confidence, but giving yourself permission to do that, to do that type of work. Cause if it's not, if it's not a job, that's um, a paid commission coming in from the get go, it can be difficult to, to justify spending time on it. But when that's all you've got is time. Sometimes that's how the best way to apply it, you know? Yeah. I do feel like though every every moment you spend in your art brain is an evolution, right? Like everything you're doing, whether it's paid or not paid, you're you're developing yourself, and right. and that's important to look at. And you know, again, like people who work full time in art, you're you know, even if you're following, let's say, a different visual path than the one that you would do as a personal artist, you're still pushing yourself because that's not something you're comfortable with, right? So. So I, yes. I love, I love that you're fine. You find that opportunity to like keep pushing yourself. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's, 
that challenge is, is part of it. Even, even if there's, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, if there's commercial work that comes in, that's maybe um, a little less inspirational or just doesn't feel like it's kind of like got all the heart and soul in it that you, that you want every project to have. I can, I can find ways to, uh, maybe it's something that's in the background or maybe there's a prop that I render in a way that that's sort of the, that project was worth that one little seed, you know, that little thing helped me grow a little step, you know, and as, as opposed to thinking, oh my gosh, it's another, it's another job that has to do with this topic. That's just, I'm just done with. But um, so sometimes you have to sort of mentally trick, ch trick yourself to, to find inspiration in the sort of the nooks and crannies, you know, sometimes. Yeah, I feel like finding a silver lining is is a talent in itself, right? Always, yeah. <laughs> always looking for the positive. This is the whole, you know, the glass is half full kind of scenario that, yeah, exactly. that there's always something you can take out of it, you know, and, and some something, some part of every situation you should be grateful for. I feel like yeah. even the crappiest situations has something that you've learned or a connection you've made or something so right and that's that's perspective right that's all keeping it in in the in the right perspective yeah absolutely absolutely i don't know if you want to show it was it is there another clip in here before um I... this is a well this is another a sort of end of the spectrum where this was a a personal project. It was a story I wanted to explore trying to figure out how to tell a story through stereographs because I, I was introduced to those. It's sort of the, a 3D viewer. So it's like um, VR from the 1850s. So it's real simple technology, but it, it's sort of, it was another sort of element of that played right into the dimensional aspect of my work. And I would show portfolios with it and it would always sort of uh, be a great conversational starter. But I always thought, well, what if it what if I pushed it further and, and actually made a story out of it? So I uh, came up with these three characters. There's the traveler, an owl, and a woodsman, um, and tried to figure out what their story would be and what their scenario would entail um, and how best to tell it. And then so the stereo cards work like this. You've got the two and you've got a viewer that will um, frame them up and sort of align them to be dimension or stereo. Uh, so I created it, but I wasn't sure how to apply it. So I, I launched a Kickstarter campaign with um, to produce these as a set of 18 cards with a viewer. Um, and it actually went through. I had no idea that it would actually pull off, but it was sort of a one of those side projects. It was like, okay, I did this, but now what do I do with it? And and now it's sort of a project that's sort of, a, you know, paid for itself in a way and, and allowed the work to grow to a, to an, to a, to an audience in a different way, as opposed, you know, it's more of a, a product that somebody will receive and like have in their hands, as opposed to just being an animation or a, a, an image on a screen. So I think it sort of adds that whole other tactile quality to the work. Um, but again, you, I don't know where it will lead to, but it, but it, but it was interesting to see where it, how it evolved as a project, you know, and I think that the, sometimes it's a, uh, especially today, you try to think of different ways to do, to get your work out there, whether you wait for the market to come to you or do you take the work to the market? You know, I think it, it works both ways. It's just how do you best take advantage of that? Yeah, absolutely. And this, what a unique way to do it in today's world. I mean, I think this, this is a beautiful expression that is unique. So kudos to you for doing this. Well, awesome. Yeah. It was, and then again, it was just one of those things where you, you feel like, um, do you take that leap or not, you know, and what, what, where will it lead, you know, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, so, so I, I, I see, I see a lot of automotive stuff in, in your work, a lot of bits and pieces. So I, I want to ask you if, if that ties into other interests that you have besides creating art that, um, you know, part, part of what, again, for better or for worse, like if you're an artist, you probably always want to be creating, but you maybe can't do that hundred percent of the time right I mean do you do you find like you have different interests that that give you more balance and and other things to occupy your brain yeah I think yes exactly I think that's a that's a great question as far as especially the balance I think you have to I know I have some peers they're just they're like you have to be art all the time in your life in the way that you cook in the way that you decorate your house in the way that you dress and I'm like it's like oh my gosh that's so exhausting you know I I want to put it into the work, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to think about my outfit that I'm going to wear today as, as an art project. Um, 
So for me, I try to find other things that, that um, balance that, I guess. So I, I tinker with old motorcycles and it's not a, um, I'm not a mechanic, but it's something that I, I, I like that sort of other end of the spectrum of, of problem solving. You know, it's uh, if you do A, B and C and you balance a carburetor, then and you make sure you have spark, then your engine will run. It's sort of like uh, with art, it's not like that for me. It's always like every project is a different solution and a different way of, of solving it. So it, that can be very, um, uh, you know, wear your brain out, you know. So I find it very for refreshing to to work down in the garage and and um, sort of have a different sort of, it's still working with my hands, but it's, you know, it's a different way of it. So that, that sort of, transportation and what the you know as far as what a motorcycle can let, allow you to go places I think that whole idea of going places permeates my work whether it's through the the illustration or the animation I think uh, the, those those uh, projects are vehicles as well you know that other metaphor to to get your work to get your work going I suppose but but no that's definitely a, a big part of the of, of my life yeah, that's a that's a great metaphor about taking you places and moving. But but yeah, I think the way the way I think about it is, you know, just like you don't work out like if you know. Let's talk about physical exercise. You don't work out just your right arm because you know you only you use that in your work, right? Like you don't you know you need to you need to take care of the whole package, which is why you know talking about other things besides art and thinking about and applying your time and energy to other things. I think it's valuable to keep you in balance. That's great. And, and you mentioned you have, you have a family. So I'm sure there's time commitments there that give you another outlet and another, another way to exist. Yeah. Oh, no, most definitely. I mean, I think uh, that's my, my family really keeps things in perspective again. I mean, <clears throat> you can't, I can't come in from, from work and say, oh, I just had the worst day and I couldn't, you know, they were like, well, what happened dad? I was like, well, I, I couldn't build this this prop like I wanted to. And, and so when you explain it like that, it's like, okay, first of all, I get to make this stuff. And even a, even a bad day of making that stuff is really a pretty good day. And that's, so they really help keep that perspective in there. I, I can't be like a, a brooding artist all the time because it's, it's, that just, it's not practical, you know? And the kids are like, dad, why are you, why are you, why are you bummed out? Because your drawing didn't work today. You know, you got to draw all day. So it's a, uh, definitely they definitely keep it in check yeah I think perspective is key and, and kids are awesome for reminding you about what's right in front of your face right, right exactly. you know I mean come yeah. on that's awesome oh yeah. well good well I while looking at the time I think we should get into some Q&A and and Matt host Matt are you on here do you want to take us through this or do you want me to read them I'm, yeah it's yeah, up to you Matt in here no no yeah, go all ahead, right. Matt. <laughs> I'll go ahead and go through these questions I'll start yeah. with this first one here um who's asking how do you deal with procrastination and originality uh procrastination and originality um that's a good one I think um the the biggest thing for me is that if if I'm if I'm distracted, I'll, I'll sketch in a sketchbook and it's not a sketchbook for work. It's just a sketchbook for, um, relaxation almost it's, or, uh, out of habit. And I feel like if I, if I do those drawings and trust those, then that, that sort of helps lead to originality and it, it allows me to create characters or scenarios that, um, are more, whether it's the words visceral or original, and it, and it allows me to sort of trust the drawing instead of me trying to think about what the drawing should be. And I think that that exercise alone really helps me fight both of those, both of those things, being, being scared of being original and, and also being um, scared of the next project at hand, you know? And I, I feel like if I can sort of step back and still draw like I drew as a kid and still trust that sort of excitement of drawing, then that's when the that's when the really good things happen, but that's, um, it's never a sure thing. So it's, it's sort of an ongoing trust with that. Great. All right. So this uh, next question is asking about, uh, if you have any advice about lighting equipment for your shoots. Oh, uh, uh, lighting equipment. I use a lot of, because of my, my stuff is relatively small scale. I use a lot of what they, what a photographer would call a key light. Um, so they're usually smaller lights. Um, 
But when I first started out, I just used whatever desk lamp I had or whatever open window I had. I don't think, um, I think that's another thing is, is to use what you have at hand and see what, what that sort of leads as far as the problem solving goes. Cause I think, yes, you could buy a light kit or you could buy this sort of camera or these types of lights, but it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not an always an, a one size fits all. It's sort of what, what works best for you. Um, and I, and I, we have a local, well, they're 30 miles away, but they're the local camera shop. And whenever I have problems or things I can't quite figure out with lights, I'll go speak with them because they, they know that lingo. And I think that um, it's good to trust people like that too, because uh, um, you, you, you had, sort of have to know where your limitations are and, and where to seek that out. But I try to keep it as simple as possible. I don't try to light with more than maybe five or six lights at the most. Sometimes um, you just go back to two or three lights and you can get a real, a real good scene without, without overdoing it. Now this next question is asking, um, how, what's like the process from going from a drawing, a two-dimensional drawing to a 3D sculpture? Um, well, when you, get that, when you get that final sketch or the, ske the, the, the sketch that's approved, that sort of becomes the blueprint. So for me, I'll, um, I'll set the camera up to that perspective and on the, just on the regular tabletop and start to mock things up. It's, sometimes it's with cardboard, sometimes um, it's with uh, just uh, blown up drawings and sort of you cut those out and try to figure out the scale and the perspective. And it allows you to sort of compose it on set very similar to the way that it's composed in that sketch and that if i if i keep trusting that that sketch and the energy that's in that drawing then the this the the end product will have that as opposed to trying to sculpt all the elements and then bring them in all on scale on the set and then work on it from there because everything's shot pretty much from one perspective you can really get away with a lot of uh, a lot of cheats as far as you know building things much like a theater set would be, where it's only seen from that one angle, that one perspective, uh, and it it allows you to cut a lot of time down, as opposed to trying to render a whole room. Or, um, and I think that goes for much like a a painter may work or a, a a digital sculpture may work that same way. I think being economical with what you have is is a smart thing in in especially your type of animation, your type of illustration, right? You know. Oh yeah, definitely. Cause it's usually you have a deadline and you have a, there's usually a, you know, there's always a project budget and you got to try to figure out the best way to sort of stay within that. And no matter what the drawing is, it's, it's sort of like once that drawing is solves the problem, then it's just a matter of, of how do you fill in those blanks and, and make it sort of, make it sort of work based on that blueprint. Very smart. This next question is asking if you would consider yourself an introvert, and if so, does that affect the way you network when you're trying to find work? Um, personally, I'm an introvert, yes, but um, when it comes to work, I'm I'm very extrovert. I'm 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 happy to show it. I'm happy to try to get it in front of people because for me, it's the it's the work that does the talking. Not I don't have to do the talking as much, and I think that 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 allows me to. Um, I have much more confidence in my work than I do my person, I suppose. So as long as I keep the work at the forefront, then then it, it usually works out for the best. Yeah, I think we, we talked about that a bit in our pre-discussion, right? Like how, how a lot of times artists know how to express themselves through their work most comfortably, right? So if, if, yeah. you have, if you're forced to communicate about yourself to get a job or to show your work, just just folk, like tune into that. Like go, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my work. And so, you know, that should hopefully open the communication a little easier. Right. right. Yeah. Because that's, no, nobody knows that better than you do, you know? And I think if you, you if you trust that and not try to uh, force it into spots, you know, right. and force it into things and let it, let it be what it is. And it, that, that definitely helps me. But um, I also have a representative and they help as well, as far as planning where to, where to put work and where to, where to look for work and how best to set work up for that market. Um, but all that still, that, that changes year to year as far as how, how to best do that. But it, it still comes down to, um, where, where that work needs to be, you know, and, and letting the work be the focus of it. Yeah. And this next question is a little related from someone who's having trouble reaching out and connecting with potential clients. 
they're wondering how do you promote and advertise your work and skills to attract people without seeming needy or desperate? Oh, goodness. Um, without seeming needy or desperate. We're all needy and desperate, right? <laughs> I think that's the, that's the biggest thing is, is everybody, even the people that you're marketing to, they're, they're still trying to do their job and do their job as best as possible. And I think if you, if you can present work that helps their helps them do their job better, you know, as far as if it's a publisher or an, or an editor or an art director, or uh, even a, and even with animation, if you can create the, the work that makes their job easier, that's, that's gonna be enough. Um, I think there's a difference between persistence and, and, and uh, annoyance, I guess. But I think <laughs> today, I think you have to be pretty hard to be annoying. I mean, I think um, with as much information that's, that's coming at everybody every day, if, if you don't, if you're not somewhat persistent um you won't be seen um but if you're annoying you'll 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 almost drive eyes away i guess and but i don't really know how best to do that um there's because there's so many outlets i think the thing is thing for me is you try to focus on the outlet that works best for you and not try to be uh you know a social media guru with with all the outlets because it's just it's just too much um the people that do it are, are blessed that they can do it but for me i really try to just focus on what what works best for me? You know, I'm not, I'm not a big Twitter user. I'm not opinionated enough to be on Twitter. I'm not social enough to be on Facebook. Essentially, you know, Instagram works better for me because it's more, it seems to be more image based and it lets the work do the talking and I don't have to talk too much. Um, but that's just sort of, that's sort of just what fits for my personality. But heck, in two years, Instagram could be gone and it could be some, you know, MySpace again, who knows? <laughs> I bet some people watching are too young to even know what MySpace is. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, but I think what you, your, your point is good is like, don't overextend yourself trying to like fill all these social media channels because there's just, there are too many. And, and, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, energy spent. And, and I think you're right. Instagram right now is the visual medium that serves you the best. I think that's great that you've sure, and that's, whittled I it down to that. Yeah. And that's the part that can get daunting when you really try to figure out there's all these options. How do you know which one is the right, the right option for you? I think it comes down to comfort and, and again, just keeping the work at the forefront. Don't try to, don't try to oversell it, but definitely don't, um, don't undersell it. Yeah. Great. These next two questions are kind of similar. So I'm going to pair them together. Uh, okay. The first one being about so from someone who says they feel discouraged about their work and sometimes become confused about their quote style. Uh, they're wondering if you ever feel that way and what you do about it. And then the second question is asking if you have any insecurity moments about your art and how you deal with that. Um, those are both great questions. I think that the, the one about style is tough because style is something that um, for me is very, or, it's organic. You know, like, like I said earlier, I, I graduated as a painter, but now I do these things that are quite on the other end of the spectrum from painting. But, but it got there, it didn't get there necessarily intentionally. It just sort of, I was led to that. Um, and I think that sort of is, is where my style grew from. But I think at the root of it, it's, it's the way that I draw. You know, my characters are wonky because I'm not a, I'm not a skilled renderer. My sketches are wonk, you know, my sketches are off. So if I trust the, if I, tr I've learned to trust that sort of what I used to think was a weakness now becomes sort of the, a trademark of my work that it's a little bit wonky. It's a little off and the perspective isn't always exactly right. And sometimes the character is a little lopsided and that sort of um, starting to trust what you would consider maybe be a weakness. It might actually be the, one of the things that makes your work that much more unique. Um, so as far as style goes, I think that's, that's a difficult one. Um, and as far as doubting work, yeah, I doubt, I doubt stuff all the time. And I think part of it is just keeping it in perspective that if you do, if you do a piece that just feels like it just failed and it just didn't work, then what are you going to do for your next one? You know, it's, it's not sort of like, Oh gosh, now I should quit. It's sort of like, okay, now I'm even hungrier to make something right or make something better. And I think that that's, that's the, that's the thing is when people ask you like, what's your favorite piece? You're like, well, hopefully the one I do tomorrow or hopefully it's the next one. You know, I think that that's, that's part of how you've got to stay 
um, naively optimistic. You know, if I think uh, another question I get sometimes is what, what do I know now that I wish I knew when I was in school? And I think the biggest thing for me is if I knew better, I probably would have known that I probably should do something like real estate or something, you know, <laughs> no, don't you know? say that. <laughs> but, it, but it's sort of that, it was that naivety that, that sort of, um, I was dumb enough to think that I could do it is, is how I did it is, is, is the thing. And I think part of it's that today you can't, you know, if you have a bad year, you got to say, okay, the next year is going to be better, you know, and it's, it's sort of, you, you kind of have to be like that, you know, glass half full all the time kind of person of, as far as it's, you, you're in it for the long haul, you know, you're in it for that, the horizon and no job's going to be perfect. Nothing. And if it is, then that's probably pretty scary. If it's, if it all turns out perfect, then what, then what, you know, so there's always something to improve on. Yeah. I feel like realizing that it, everything's a roller coaster in some way, right? You got to ride the ups and downs. That's natural for sure. most yeah. things. Yeah, not that's even, life. yeah, that's life. It's not even just work. It's life. So you, <laughs> you know, once you accept that, then it's easier to settle into the ride. Yeah. Uh, this next question is asking how many hours a day do you dedicate to working on your art? Uh, really, essentially it's about, it's about eight hours, seven hours. Um, and sometimes I'll come back in, in the evenings and put a few hours in if, if the project requires, but, um, you know, before kids, it was more like 12 hours or 15 hours. And, and I think it's, the, the families really helped me kind of put it back into perspective that you can, I'm surprised at how efficient I can be now, as opposed to, you know, maybe 15 years ago, it's, it's sort of, again, it's sort of just changed it a little bit. And I probably don't do, I probably don't do as many jobs as I did before, but I feel like the jobs that I do are of, of better quality. Um, so it's not always a necessarily a, an issue of um, more hours or, or more jobs. It's sort of, you know, the quality of those hours and the quality of those jobs, but yeah, it definitely fluctuates. I mean, life, life makes it fluctuate. Right. But I think refining your process is something that just comes with time, right? Like, oh, you know, yeah. as you've been doing this over the years, you learn how to be more efficient in this or that piece of it. And it, and it just, you know, is more efficient. So right. yeah. someday, <laughs> Some, someday. And again, not always because the roller exactly. coaster, right? The roller coaster. So, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of basically what the next question is, is how do you manage your time when you're working from home? Um, I think the, the biggest thing for me is, is, is when the, when the kids are in school, that's when I've got, that's, that's like my time. Like I, so I'll, you know, I, I break for lunch and then I'm back at it. I try not to um, mess with other things, you know, weekends, I try to put on housework and that type of things. But during the, during the work days, it's, I really try to keep those hours and that because I just have that sort of limited time span of, of when the kids are occupied, you know, and other than that, when they're outside of that, then I've got to figure out ways to, you know, deal, deal with that and, and be a dad and not be a, a, an artist, I guess, in some ways, but that they, they goes hand in hand. Yeah, I think, I think having that discipline during the week, like during your work week, whenever that is, right, sure. is, is key yeah. to getting anything done. So, right. you know, again, like, it's that balance of, of letting your mind be free enough to be artistic, but also acknowledging you probably have a deadline you hit on these things. So, you know, Most working into that mode is, is a balance. Yeah. 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 And de deadlines are a great motivator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This next question is asking if you ever feel burnout um, as an independent. Um, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily feel burnt burnout because it, it's a, uh, the, the great thing about being a, like a freelance illustrator is that every job is, is really is different at the core. It's all about that problem, you know, problem solving that visual. It's not, and there's not a lot of formula. Yeah. Some of what I do, there's, there's a way that I light or a way that um, my characters are sort of sculpted, but um, because so much, so much of it is um, there's so many different aspects of art in what I do as far as, there's sketching and painting and building and lighting and photography that all those aspects just keep me energized. When I was a painter, when a job got approved and then you would paint, it just felt like you were kind of coloring in the lines. And I would, I would get sort of, uh, I don't know, a bit foggy. And so doing the type of work that I do now folds into all those things that really got me excited as a young student and keeps me excited today is that there's all these aspects that, 
even if the drawing wasn't exactly the best, maybe the way that it's lit will be better or, you know, everything, there's always a chance for improvement because there's so many facets to it. So it, it really keeps me from getting, getting to be burnout. And I'm not, I'm seriously, I don't get that much work that I'm, that I, like, I don't have a staff, you know, it's, it's really pretty, it's pretty moderate what comes through, you know. We got a couple of questions asking um, how you select materials for your works. Um, well, like the let me let me think. Uh, like so, armatures are are basically wire armatures, so they're, it's real simple. Um, there's a, so they have a, a degree of flexibility to them um, and posability, but they're not they're not very super involved. Um, a lot of times with fabrics, I just have an assortment of fabrics that kind of become your painting palette. And when you, so when I'm sewing a costume, the, the fabrics that I have on hand, sort of you try to find that the stuff that fits the right palette to whether it's from a color study or based on other elements in the image. Um, and a lot of things are just made out of, honestly, it's painted cardboard. It's real, it's sort of whatever's quick and dirtiest as far as that goes, because, um, even with a sheet of cardboard, the way that you paint it or light it, it can really make it feel like a, uh, you know, like a, a beautiful patina surface. And it's um, all those sort of things kind of play, play into it. Sometimes a material will actually make a piece better than I would have anticipated, you know, or a found object, you know? And I think sometimes that sort of stuff really, again, mm, gives you these little surprises that if, if I'm excited about the image, then it's only gonna make it that much better, you know? And I think sometimes those little surprises really help that the momentum of that excitement continue. I was just thinking about the one piece that you showed earlier about all the pieces of mail in cartons sitting around <laughs> a desk. I was like, oh my God, having to create that. I'd be like, oh, I, I can't yeah. even imagine how you continue on that path and not lose your um, excitement. Oh, sure. <laughs> But you did it and it looked awesome. So you just, you just carry on. I want to make another, yeah, exactly. another, yeah. Tin of, you, you, another you carton of mail. You, you kind of hit a rhythm. You're like, okay, I'm making envelopes today. And that's all I'm doing is I'm making envelopes. You know, yep. that, you, you just find a way to, to make the best darn envelopes you can make. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, we got a couple of questions asking if you went to art school and if you did, which art school did you go to? Yeah, so I went to the Art Academy of Cincinnati. It's just, it was a, it, it is, it's, it's still there. It's a sort of more of a fine art college, but it, it was a, it's a super, it was super small at the time. I think there were maybe 30 kids in my class. So it was small enough that you could, you could do any sort of type of art that you wanted. You could, you had access to the photo lab or the wood shop. Um, you had access to print shops. And I think, the access to all of that material sort of really helped me um, foster a lot of that growth in, in, in me as a young artist, where with some of the larger schools, if you're not in the photo department, you don't have access to that photo lab or, you know, so for being in that small school was a great opportunity to me sort of, for me to be able to kind of get my fingers in all these kinds of things that I didn't even know existed prior to college. And I think that that, uh, all of that stuff sort of feeds into what, even what I do today. Um, so even though it wasn't a, I didn't go to school to be a three-dimensional illustrator, um, but everything I learned in school feeds right into what I do. We have another group of questions that are asking, what kind of music do you listen to for inspiration? Oh, music. Uh, goodness. There's, there's actually, I stream a, a station out of Seattle. It's called KEXP. And uh, I just love their um uh, eclectic music it's all over the board every dj is different um and it just keeps me um uh i don't know inspired by all this other good stuff that's happening and that i i'm not musically inclined so if i hear a music a musician from zimbabwe and then i hear a musician from austin um all that just sort of makes me uh, excited about what's going on out there and i'm not intimidated by it because i i can't even get close to it so it's, I find it very inspiring to listen to that. That's, that's a great way to take their creative energy and sort of fuel yours with it. So that's awesome. Yeah. Now this next question is asking if you've ever worked in 3D and I think they mean specifically like on a computer. Oh, uh, not, not officially. I've tried, but it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to wrap my head around that. I, I think um, um, 
I, I think I need to do a couple classes on it because I can't quite figure it out on my own, but I've tried a couple different modeling softwares and uh, because I see a lot of, again, a lot of amazing stuff being done, but I think so much of what I do is, is so tactile and, re and relies on the physicality of things. Um, it's, it's really hard for me to sort of get past that and it's almost a, a hurdle. So sometimes it makes me feel uh, very inadequate not being able to sort of at least get a grasp on that technique. I can't even, I can't even like, I, yeah, it's, it'd be, it's like sculpting with my feet. I just can't figure it out. <laughs> but you don't have to do every kind of art there is, right? I You're mean, right. That's, You're that's right. the thing. <laughs> it, yes, it would test your, your skill set and expand you in that way, but you don't have to do everything. So, right. you know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sort of, again, optimistic about my limitations, you know, it's. <laughs> You're yeah. maximizing your talents. Yeah. That's great. Look at it that way. Wow, well, gosh, we only have one minute left. I don't know, Matt, you think there's one more we can squeeze in? Oh yeah, you guys have a couple extra minutes if you have the time to stay a little bit longer. It's up to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't mind answering questions at all. That's totally fine by me. Uh, this one's kind of in line with the last 3D question, but uh, have you considered or have you tested using 3D printing? Uh, that's another good question. Um, I haven't tested it yet. Um, I've, 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 I've learned about it and done some workshops and sort of uh, study, st I follow some other artists that do it. But again, it's sort of, um, I'm almost uh, intimidated by the possibilities, but I think a lot of it, the, the best 3D printing comes from work that's 3D sculpted or 3D rendered, you know? So it, to, to like scan the sculpture and then print it out, it's, you really lose a lot. Of, there's a lot lost in translation, at least what I've experimented with. So it's again comes back to that sort of my inability to to sculpt digitally sort of limits what I can produce with the three with three D printing because because a lot of what I do isn't isn't necessarily you know miniaturized or or small versions of real things it's sort of small versions but they're they're off they're they're not perfect little printouts and that that sort of again is is part of the charm of what I do. I think it's all the charm of what you do. Everything is so unique that you craft that, that embracing that is, is magic. So. Yeah, I think that it, that's part of it is uh, again, just embracing the things that, that maybe you thought were, if you looked at it from a different perspective would be considered weaknesses as far as that, you know, I'm not a sculptor, but I can, I can sculpt what I draw, but I'm, but I couldn't, I can't, I'm not like the artist Kent Melton and he can sculpt anybody's, rendering and any sort of stylistic aesthetic and just elevate it to a whole nother level like that that is just that's like godlike to me you know to see that so when I'm inspired by that but then it's it's hard because I go and try to sculpt and it's like I can just like this is how I sculpt ears <laughs> like I can't there's no there's no other option this is just how it this is how I do it um so it's 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 wild to see artists that can do that that can have that sort of skill set that's that seems to be endless uh, we have a question from someone who's wondering um how did you get your first commission from the new yorker and how did you approach working with them um hmm. i'm trying to remember how that came about i've only worked with them a few times um and it pretty much was i think one of the assistants in the art department was actually from Indiana and had seen some of my work and was intrigued that we both came from the same state. And that's sort of, I think, what led to that first project. Um, but it, so it was really sort of a, it wasn't, it wasn't a direct contact at all. And I, I had submitted stuff to him for years and it just, you, you have to submit it until it resonates with somebody on some level. And the fact that it resonated because I'm from Indiana is sort of odd, but, but it's that, that's again, is just one of those sort of, um, Dumb, dumb luck, sort of right place at the right time kind of things. Um, so again, it, it, it really wasn't, a, it, was de, it was deliberate in that it's in, in its intention, but it, it, it sort of came about in an odd way. Yeah, I mean, you never know when the connection's gonna hit, right? So you just yeah, get exactly. out there. That's, and... the, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, someone's wondering about how did you develop your studio uh, behind you? They say it's so neat. Was that a project in itself? Uh, it's evolved. I mean, it's, I didn't have shelves for a long time. And then you know, it's like, okay, I'll have to build shelves. And 
Um, I eventually learned to, to, if I put the tables on wheels, it, it allows the studio to be more flexible and you could do two or three sets at one time. Um, that's the, I think that was the, some of the biggest thing, um, but some of it hasn't moved in 15 years. It's kind of weird when, when you're in a spot for a long time, you're like, I didn't even like the dust is just crazy. Like you move something and you're like, that's just about disgusting. But <laughs> I'm uh, telling you, the dust, the dust is driving my brain crazy. Just thinking about that. And this is because I have kids with Legos and that I know yeah. what that is. So yeah. your level is tremendously bigger than that. My, my wife was delighted that I wasn't in a second bedroom anymore. I mean, that's the, we, she, she tolerated it for so long as far as either me being in a basement or in another bedroom or in the living room. Um, so she was delighted that we had a garage. I could actually keep everything, you know, behind closed doors, I guess. Uh, similarly, someone's asking about how your studios evolved as far as equipment has goes, like as new technology appears, like what did you start with and what do you use now? How has that changed? Well, I've been, I've been doing it long enough. I started with a four by five camera. So I would shoot on four by five transparencies and, you know, then you would take the film and you would process it at the photo lab. And are you really, you're lab, dating yourself here. here yes, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> um, and then the photo labs went out of business and then I was processing, you know, film in my laundry room and it just got, it got ridiculous, but about, it was, about that same time is when digital cameras became, you know, uh, much better, and and you could sort of buy a, a low end professional camera that didn't didn't mean you had to mortgage your house. Um, and then about that, so then I was like, I'm spending so much time processing film. If I had if I shot digitally, it it would again sort of make it a little more efficient. So it's sort of whatever works with technology. But um, you know, it used to have to fax sketches and FedEx originals and the um so it's all sort of evolved with that just along with the industry um but everything else is pretty basic it's lights and camera and and tabletop sets it's it doesn't get too much more technical than that i know we're running tight on time here so i maybe just one last question before we let you okay. guys go sure um this person is asking how much creative freedom do you usually get to have in your work um, every, pro every project's different and usually look with editorial. So like that would be magazine work. Um, it's very, it's very open and that's generally because budgets are a little smaller. Um, timelines are usually a little more flexible. Um, book covers are, are definitely a little more restrictive as far as it, it, your sketches have to be approved by usually a committee as opposed to just one or two in the art department. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is advertising work, which is it's it's usually much more specific about what the needs are, and um, but it's all just part of it. So usually with advertising work, they'll come with a concept, but they they want me to render it in my way, you know. And sometimes it can be as literally as that. So um, it, every project's sort of different. But I've been very fortunate enough that people come to me because of the work that I do, as opposed to, you know, in earlier years, they were like, well, we need it. We need it to look like a Ken doll. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And it never worked, you know? And now it's just sort of this, you're doing it long enough that they sort of know this is what they're going to get. There's, it's, this is the spectrum. It's, you know, um, again, that's your limitations becoming your strengths, I suppose. Yeah. And I'm sure you are sought after for your style, your, your vision, you know, now. So that's amazing. Yeah, that's the, that's the goal, right, for sure. Yeah. Well, gosh, I think that's probably all we have time for today. Yeah, thank you, yeah. everybody. So thank you, Chris. It was an honor to meet you and to get acquainted with your work. Thank you, Tina and everybody at CTN for having us online. We're so grateful to be connected in this time of being at home. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we appreciate your attention and time here with us today. Thank you, Tracy. I sure appreciate it. Ditto on all of that. Yeah. All right. Well, then All right. we'll say bye, everyone. Bye.